Welcome to Recogs, the show where we learn how the world's best business operators build consumer brands from sourcing to selling. Brought to you by Manufactured. Manufactured is an online platform that helps brands manufacture, finance, and distribute inventory across 20 industries in 25 countries. If you're interested in learning more, check out Manufactured.com. I'm your host, Mike Gelb, and today we have Jay Blasco, Senior Vice President of Operations at Sunday. Sunday is a Boulder-based startup that's reinventing the lawn and garden space. We focus this conversation about the trials and tribulations of what it's like building out the operations of an early stage company. Some of the product, shipping, and store challenges they had to experience and that they problem solved and balancing the overall operations and marketing. Without further ado, here's Jay. Jay, thank you so much for joining me here today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mike. Super excited to get on with you here. Yeah, really excited to dive in. Um, as you know, like I had Coulter, uh, the founder, one of the founders of uh, of Sunday on my other podcast. And so um, really, really excited. Who's obviously, as you know, terrific. Um, really excited to have you on and talk about the operation side and the inventory and the from an inventory perspective, um, the, the Sunday journey. Um, so from the very beginning, Jay, how did you meet? culture and trend at at sunday what made you want to join sunday and how'd you become like their first hire yeah um the short of it is uh a lot of networking and a bit of good luck uh but but i can unpack that a little more for you um i i was coming off an amazing ride at my first startup uh, a sports nutrition company that i helped grow from 10 to 100 million in, in five years and after, yeah, after that journey, um, which culminated in closing a growth equity round, I was eager to do it again and had the itch to, to, to grow something else. Um, and so I was looking for a new venture. Um, so I, I sought out entrepreneurs in the, the Boulder, Colorado food and beverage space. There's a huge, vibrant community here so looking for uh, another up and coming brand to help grow. So I had the the good fortune of meeting a lot of amazing founders and did a bit of consulting. Um, and a few months of after a few months of that, uh, I think Luke Vernon from Ridgeline Ventures, who was also one of the guests of your podcast, love Luke. He's great. Yeah, Luke's awesome. Yeah, he, uh, he introduced me to Coulter, um, and and we we met in Boulder and just started talking shop. Um, you know why I decided to to join and, and why I saw this opportunity for me. Yeah, I think it was the the right opportunity in every sense in that um, there was an alignment in personal professional values that I found between me and Coulter. Um, the brand resonated with me and the product offering as well. And um, and at the time, uh, e-com and DTC was a space that I really wanted to get into. Cool. That's awesome. Um, and so you decided to, even though you were looking around for um, food and beverage companies in Boulder, which I'd imagine there's a handful of, of food and beverage companies um, um, in Boulder, you decided not to then go back to kind of food and beverage, which, which was what you came from. That's right. Um, I decided to follow the dream of working in a lawn care company, right? which I'm sure... <laughs> um, so yeah, it was not... The opportunity is not one that I had in mind, obviously. Um, but I, I did know Coulter and his wife from their previous company, you know, Quinn Snacks. Is it better for you? Um, company that started and is still run by his wife, Christy. Awesome brand that I followed. So I was aware of him and them indirectly as local entrepreneurs and, you know, appreciated the, the brand ethos and aesthetic they developed. And I figured Coulter would bring the same talent and values to this new venture. Um, but, uh, and, and which is true, but regarding the product, I think it was a, a right fit for me in, in the sense that I was its target customer and that, uh, when we met at the time I had recently bought our first house, had our first kid, um, and that summer I'd spent several hundreds, hundreds of dollars on sod and other lawn care products only to have it die and go to waste in a few, a few weeks. So I come from Florida. We don't have to water much there because it's constantly raining. Colorado, I learned the hard way that you know, tent needs constant care, watering, fertilizing, etc. And I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Um, and at the time, you know, that coupled with the time, glad to say, you know, the main active ingredient roundup was in the headlines, getting linked to cancer and lawsuits across the country. Right. So the promise of a guided DIY solution in this space, made without toxic chemicals, was really compelling to me as a homeowner in a new dent. 
that's really compelling. Um, since, um, as you say, you were the exact, you were the exact target customer. You, you try other products that they didn't work. Um, and, um, and that, that makes a lot. And also just kind of this like belief in, in Coulter and obviously, um, you know, even though it's not food and beverage, you know, Coulter does come from a, a, a food and bev, uh, background as well. Um, um, so that's, that's awesome. Um, so you joined the company as, you know, it was pre-revenue. Um, and I guess they, they, they had a product. Um, obviously you knew what the product was, but, um, it was pre-revenue. There wasn't there. They hadn't yet, yet launched D2C. Where was it currently in terms of the manufacturing process? Like was the entire supply chain built out? Um, what, were there parts that you need, were there several gaps or holes that you needed to fill in? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll give a little context on this industry in terms of just the broader supply chain, and then I'll answer that. And, and that um, the interesting thing about Lawn and Garden um, is that there isn't a lot of innovation on this space, right? Um, at least on the consumer side, there aren't many new, cool, up-and-coming brands is the, the industry is dominated by a couple of decades old incumbents. You probably guess at least one of them, right? So uh, the manufacturing capacity and innovation out there is mostly focused on industrial and agricultural application. Um, and the result is that unlike other consumer categories, food, beverage, apparel, cosmetics, there isn't a network of established commands and suppliers out there for our categories. Um, so maybe what you're getting at, like in this category, it's, present quite the challenge in building that supply chain um, early on. So it did require a bit of outsized effort. Were other companies, were they were they typically vertically integrated as well or no? Um, the incumbents are. Um, yeah, the incumbents are typically vertically integrated. And the smaller brands out there um, are hybrid. A lot of them you know, self-manufactured at a very small scale. So we set out to create a, an asset light um, supply chain, right, where we want to partner with uh, co-manufacturers and co-packers. So, specifically to your question, you know, I came in as first hire, but um, Trent at the time, he and Coulter were working for, I guess, almost a year before I joined, kind of setting up the, the, the basic supply chain in terms of, um, you know, after a lot of cold calling, emailing, Trent had found a, um, a regional um, fertilizer co-manufacturer that was willing to work with us and um, a weed control supplier and um, one or two packaging vendors that um, were willing to work with us. You know, by the time I joined, you know, they, they got maybe about 80% of the initial product formulation out of the way for our first three SKUs. Um, and so by the time I joined, it was... Um, getting ready to launch for the spring. I think we had four months to finish formulation, um, figure out uh, how much we wanted to order, um, and launch a new 3PL. That was the other facet of the supply chain that wasn't set up yet that um, I had to start up early on, um, which was getting after getting it ordered, produced to our 3PL, uh, and packed out in the way that uh, we wanted to offer our customers. Was there a particular ingredient or, you know, a couple ingredients that were actually just really hard to source for your, for your product early on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, seaweed particularly, um, is, yeah, I think we ended up using one out of New England, but in, in terms of sourcing, you know, um, Sunday's main product is about a, a three pound pouch of fertilizer, right? It's think of, uh, for listeners, like a, a giant baby food or applesauce pouch. And it turns out shipping li- that and liquid across the country is not very easy. <laughs> you know, prone to a lot of leaks. Um, and where I'm going with this is that uh, actually the amount of work that we put in into developing the spouted um, bottle cap and the actual cap itself required a lot of innovation on our part. Um, partnering with uh, a couple companies in Asia and Europe. And thankfully, we have an we have awesome R&D and physical product development team here. Um, we spent uh, quite a lot of time in the beginning in the next few years really um, optimizing that setup so we can ship at the scale and speed that we need to. 
So the packaging side of it um, and the actual form factor, that part was actually really hard as well, um, just from a, sh- a, a shipping standpoint to actually figure out um, in the early days. Right. Both of, both of the, the formulas and it's the formula itself and the form factor. So a couple of quick stories there. So um, on the form factor and right, when Colton Trent did their first test early on, a few hundred beta testers, you know, they, they loaded up their trucks, dropped it off at UPS, and they got a call a few um, a few hours later saying, hey, this stuff is leaking all over the place. Like, we, we, we can't ship this. Um, and, you know, we, we ended up over-engineering a corrugate around each pouch like a shoebox almost, and that's how we launched our first year. Fast forward a year later, I got a little overconfident and said, nah, we don't need to over, over-box this stuff. And, uh, you know, at this point, we were shipping pallets of fertilizer across the country. UPS calls again and says, this stuff's all over our facility. We're going to shut you guys down unless you fix this at ASAP. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, the form factor is super crucial. Um, yeah. As for the fertilizer itself, you know, rewind back our, you know, um, the formulas that we create besides, I mean, better for you, you know, a lot friendlier to, to people and pets. Um, it's dense, right? It's why most fertilizer out there is in solid granular form, not liquid. It's it's actually really hard to pack the amount of um, nutrition and ingredients into liquid and, and keep it um, in a liquid form. So we learned that the hard way is, you know, our first year in business, which was rife with all sorts of debacles that I'm happy to, to talk about. But one of them is that um, one of our three pouches early on, right, that, that we spent a lot of time crafting, developing, producing. When it got delivered to our 3PL, the shipments of fertilizer were hard as a brick. They had solidified for a reason unknown to us at the time. And so, yeah, we had to, to scramble to get new shipment, figure out what was wrong, and to uh, you know, message our, our customers at the time that, hey, we're experiencing a, a delay. Please hang on. Stay with us. We're going to figure this out and, and do right by you guys. So all sorts of fun challenges on the fertilizer front, both on the liquid itself and on the packaging form. Wow. That is, um, that's wild. Um, I mean, I'm just kind of going back, getting like uh, calls from UPS saying, hey, our entire trucks are leaking because of your product. Oh, their facilities. Their facilities. Like yeah. Oh my God. Like their facilities are leaking because of your product. Like we're going to shut you guys down. That must've been pretty, pretty crazy to hear. That's crazy. How as well did you approach when you were when you were building out? How also did you approach like your your three PL? We learned the hard way. That's probably one of the most crucially important relationships to to get right, uh, especially for a small direct to consumer brand. Um, we learned uh, a lot of things there in our, in our first year and in the resulting few years. You know, our first year we. We connected with a uh, fairly large 3PL that was um, servicing a lot of other large, um, prominent direct-to-consumer companies, and we learned the hard way there that you know being a you know, first-year, very small volume brand, we weren't getting the attention that we needed, right? um, and uh, it got to the point where how how did you know you weren't getting like the attention? Oh yeah, that you yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Um, well, uh, service level agreement SLAs was to ship uh, our forecast, our agreed upon forecast, um, 99% uh, within a day and a half, right? Like that's what you'd expect. Within the first two months, we were they were shipping 30% uh, within that SLA, and most, or, and we were doing only a few hundred orders at this week, a, a week, right? I remember being on the phone like begging the. Uh, begging them to ship 30 orders a day, right? Which is just laughably like, small. We, we could have done that at our office. And we actually did resort to doing that at our, our office. Our, our dedicated customer service team started doing that. So um, I mentioned we launched in April. Um, and so April, May, we couldn't get anything done. And so one of the things that I, I did I fairly aggressively was just escalate up the chain. Um, and so we got in touch with you know, the, the most senior folks we can get, and they eventually, they essentially told us, uh, hey, we have to make a hard choice. We're constrained by labor and we just can't service you guys. And so we said, okay, um, understand. So I got on a plane um, 
got the facility, started loading your stuff into trucks, and then I spent a week touring three states of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, looking for a new 3PL partner, like, you know, six weeks after we launched or something like that. So it was like open heart surgery on our supply chain, like right at launch. And, uh, you know, I was, thankfully I met some folks who connected me to a few viable, like more smaller options, which in hindsight was, was the right type of partnership for us, right? They didn't have the, the best rates or the best technology, but what they were willing to offer was the attention and care that, that we needed, right? That, that the bigger players just weren't able to, dip, weren't able to give us. Um, and so we found a, we found a small partner and, you know, totally moved all our inventory, changed our operations, right? Just like a couple of months into our launch. Um, and we made it work, right? We, we survived that. And was it, was it the type of thing where like when you did launch, like there was a lot of demand? Um, that like the marketing resonated and the, and you actually already were getting kind of sales off the back that this was like an oh crap moment because because orders are not getting actually uh, uh, fulfilled or was it a bit more kind of gradual slow out of the gate? It was definitely an oh crap moment, <laughs> 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 which is great. It was a good. It's an awesome problem to have, right? Yes. Um, and you know one of the things early on, you know, back in the day when people worked in offices. Our customer service team was with us in the office. There was, you know, ten of us, and half the team was customer service. And so, for those first few weeks, I had to listen to my teammates handle calls from angry customers uh, every day. And there's nothing more motivating slash painful than hearing your teammates have to face, you know, the frontline wrath of customers um, because something that you or I owned, right, uh, just wasn't delivering. So um, that was definitely really motivating to, to, to get right. But in terms of overall demand, your question, yeah, we, we, um, we did some tests early on, Colton and Trent did, and they found some good signals. So we started to invest some real ad dollars and launch our campaigns. We, uh, we saw strong interest right off the bat, right? And we, we set out to acquire a certain number of subscribers and when these three PL issues happened, um, we had to constrain ourselves. Right? It, we knew that um, we had the opportunity there, but we had to pace um, to deliver what we can get right as we didn't want to you know, sacrifice the brand reputation before it really got off the ground. So maybe that's that it means to like maybe scaling back like on the ad side, scaling back maybe on the marketing side in order to kind of get the operations and because you're already, you know, kind of over overpack with with customers you don't quite have the capacity right now in order to do it just because of the three pl difficulties um is that is that in terms of like making sure that 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 kind of this was like a well-oiled machine that, that's right that's exactly what we had to do i had, I had calls you know, weekly calls with our um our leadership team and talking to head of marketing weekly it was uh, um he was asking he was eager to go right we were we were fortunate to have external advisors from, from Dollar Shave Club early on. We actually hired one of the heads of marketing from Dollar Shave Club early on. And so they saw the opportunity and were eager to go. And, you know, I had to be the guy saying, I know, guys, I'm sorry. We, we got to slow down. Like, hold the spend. <laughs> so. Oh, my gosh. Oh my God. And it's also like, because um, like from an in inventory planning perspective, like it's a, it's a, it's also, I'd imagine, like a pretty, great business as well right because it is like a you, you, right. it is a, it, it's a subscription um like how how did you approach inventory planning maybe um uh, maybe afterwards after you have like that been a two three month period of of the 3pl crisis yeah so that's one of the cool things about our business that you're alluding to is that um one subscription um for the most part a lot of our customers choose to pay up front um but uh, the really cool, unique thing from a from an inventory management standpoint is that you know, Sunday, the, the offering that we um, provide is prescribes the products to customers. Right? They sign up and and they're looking for the guidance. Like, right? They they don't want to go to to the big box retailers and figure out what they want. So that's the service that Sunday provides. So what that means is that um, Sunday creates the tailored plans, right, based off of geography, lawn size, heat stress little fertilizer laws. So um, what that means is that uh, demand is on a skew level is fairly forecastable, if that's a word. 
Um, it's a word now. It's a word now. It's a word now. Yeah. So, um, you know, as we were able to create the the profile of customers right, with a big enough sample size, we were able to project, okay, how many of each um, formulation we needed, right, to fulfill our subscriber acquisition goals. Got it. Got it. Now that's, um, yeah, that, that makes sense in terms of, and it's also great that of course the customers are paying for a year long, uh, subscription for, um, for the service. Um, do you, do you find in terms of like on the, on the, on, the, on new customers that, on uh, on acquiring new customers that it typically is, of course, it's a year on business in terms of for long care, but do you find that customers are, are paying attention more so into particular months and that actually acquiring new customers are actually, uh, seasonal? Yeah, that's right. Surprise, surprise, long care is fairly seasonal. So our our acquisition is heavy in the months of spring, um, though we ship year round and um, right with through early fall and you know with the advent of our wholesale right, brick and mortar retail business, um, Sunday ships year round now, right? Piping our wholesale retailers and uh, year round for for the spring of the next year. But yes. Um, Core direct to consumer acquisition happens in the spring um, for our core fertilizer products, um, and you know, we're expanding into new categories with slightly offset seasonality, like pest control, to help round that out for us. So, uh, uh, how do you think about like I guess inventory planning from from that perspective when it comes to new uh, new customers? Because of course you have you know current customers as long as they don't churn, hopefully they don't churn, um, and they and and they kind of keep um, uh, keep buying from you all. Um, well, of course it's like the, they pay once and then of course, but you're, you're replenishing, you know, year round, but, but since like your, your high season actually is seasonal, at least for your, um, for your core product, how, how did you think about that from, from an inventory planning perspective right now, focusing primarily on like, on like the, the DDC channel. So I'm um, going to speak to a couple of points there for our customer retention for our returning customers. Yes. That's one of the things that we're super proud of our customer retention rate, probably two or three X, like the average consumer. Uh, subscription out there, which yeah, we're something we're really proud of, which really speaks to you know the offering, the market fit there, the the thought that goes into it, the service that our team provides. Um, but in terms of you know like forecasting demand for new customers, right? We we do our of course do our financial planning. Um, we come up with a number of subs that are allowable CAC that we all agree upon after lots and lots of uh, uh, iterations. Um, then we have a, a pretty cool internal tool we call our lawn engine. Um, and it's, uh, as a forecasting tool, it's, it's pretty fancy, sophisticated Monte Carlo simulations that, that go way above my Excel skills that <laughs> our engineers do. And it factors all those things we talked about, right, of, of geography, lawn size, fertilizer laws, et cetera. So they're able to say, okay, you want to acquire X many subs at this cadence throughout the year. Um, okay, based on our lawn plan algorithms, here's what you'll need for the year, right? Here are the patches that you'll need every every week, right? Um, and so that becomes a uh, an iterative thing, right, that we constantly rerun as we actualize our plans. And, um, you know, if we're ahead or behind or heavier in certain areas than others, we're able to adjust that and factor that into the calculations and adjust inventory based on that. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. And I know that, you know, as you alluded to as well, you head into retail, which congrats. Um, you're in Target, you're in Lowe's, you're in Walmart. That's um, incredible. I know that obviously Sunday, part of the allure to consumers is the fact that it's a subscription that you don't need to think about it, that you're going to get long, long care re replenished for you. So you always have long care looking great. What's part of that strategy? Because of course, in retail, you don't have that. You don't have. You can't really do subscription in retail. I don't think that. I don't think that we've all figured that out yet, right? How to do subscription in retail, maybe. But how? What? Um. So what? I guess. How did you all factor into when it made sense? Um. Because still, like the majority, of course, of 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 sale, you know, just it um uh is of course in retail versus um e commerce, um uh just on a, on a macro level but how did you how did you decide when it was right to enter retail and also which channels to actually enter the, the funny thing about culture and i and launching this e-commerce company that neither of us done e-commerce before we were both like wholesale brick and mortar guys right so but just to say we had plenty of uh, battle scars from our, our past startups on this um 
And so the the really weird slash super fortunate thing with Sunday is that from the get go the retailers came to us. Right? It, it was uh, early on we got an, a customer service team a few months after launch we got an email from Target and they go, hey, someone from Target wants to talk to us. Like, what, what is this about? <laughs> and so um, and same with other retailers, right? A few months um, after they saw what we were doing and you know on that. What we're doing with our new approach is bringing a new consumer into the category, right? With a much more approachable um, offering to lawn and garden care. They saw that we were able to grow the category, right? Where most brands say they're going to grow the category, but they just end up horse trading existing customers. You know, we were actually doing it, right? Nearly half of our customers say like they hadn't regularly used fertilizer before, but you know, our empowering approach like brings them to it. So retailers wanted that, right? We had. We had one retailer <laughs> that kind of hit the nail on the head. They said, uh, you know, my customer is an old white man, and if I don't do something about it, like, my category is just going to keep shrinking. So uh, I need a product like Sunday to help bring you know, a new demographic to it. Um, so uh, we had a lot of, which is to say we had a lot of uh, wholesale retailer interest from the get-go, but one of our learnings early on is that Selling into retailers is the easy part, and selling through um, inventory and and on shelf is the hard part. So, with that in mind, you know, though retailers were aggressively pursuing this early on, we asked ourselves, you know, do we have the manufacturing logistics capacity to do this? Could we do it well? Do we have the internal capacity and know how to do it? Know how? Um, and do we have the cost structures to make it work? And early on, the answers to a lot of those were no. We, we're not ready for this. We can't do this. And even though these, you know, two guys from, or three guys from wholesale businesses came from that, and we said, no, now's not the time to be doing that. Um, so we said no a lot early on, right, which was like something unheard of in our past life. We were begging retailers to talk to us. Just give us five minutes, please. We have a beautiful, fancy deck. Um, and so uh, after a couple years where, um, you know, we, we decided early on, you know, when we go into retail, right, um, the motivation there is, yes, Sunday is a, it's a customized subscription, but the mission is ultimately to provide a new approach to get folks outside better connected with their own plots of land, right? So we figured retail is, is still a viable way to do that, especially as a huge part of the customers are there, and a lot of habits, and um, there's a viable chance to, to change those habits. And, to get folks connected with a Sunday ecosystem with the knowledge of the concept, maybe the subscription one day. So, um, you know, we, we decided early on that when we were going to launch with a retailer, it needed to be a retailer that was um, that was all in on Sunday, that was that was uh, willing to invest in Sunday in terms of you know um, partner with us and not see us as a you know a brand to just shake down slotting fees from. Right, we wanted a retailer to, to partner with and was motivated and patient enough to grow. As you know, we knew though we had success in DTC, you know, we knew from our past lives that retailers are always going to be, usually it's a slog, right? It always takes longer than we expect it to. So um, Walmart was that partner early on. It, it, not, um, not only that you might think uh, an obvious choice in the beginning, but you know, their situation, they were a distant third behind the two big home improvement box retailers, Walmart or Lowe's and Home Depot, in this category, and they wanted they wanted to get ahead, right? Um, Walmart does um, a surprising amount in this space, and they wanted to get ahead and, and take a chance on um, on being one of the first to partner with Sunday. So their leadership was bought in um, and had a vision with us and asked us to help create, you know. Um, that path forward for Sunday at retail. So uh, that's when we decided to make the jump. And you know, with that, we we still negotiated down the doors. We negotiated down the SKUs, right? And for the sake of discipline and being able to mitigate risks early on. Um, and so that worked for us, right? It allowed us to, to learn fast and to scale up in our second year. So. Um, you know, specifically, they wanted us to go chain wide our first year. We thought, well, no way we can handle that. Um, so we negotiated down to like 700 doors. Um, and year two, you know, once we were able to prove that, we, we scaled up nationwide. 
I, I, um, I, I really appreciate you being forthcoming about that, about that, because I think that as, as you say, like for most brands, you know, D to C brands that are about to enter, um, into retail. Oh, wow. You get a knock on the door from retail. This is incredible. Let's go out. Let's go big. Let's go, you know, nationwide and let's invest all our resources, you know, into it where you actually made, um, you're actually very thoughtful and saying, Hey, actually we, we will if, if we did this, we couldn't support retail. Like we don't actually have the, we, we don't quite have like the supply chain set up. We don't have uh, the manufacturing. We maybe don't have like the three PL. We don't, we don't really have like a lot of things that I could actually support, like um, to give us a real shot at getting in retail. Right. How long did it take when you, when you first started getting like in a few months in, um, and uh, knowing that, you know, retail's on the horizon at some point, when did you, how did you have to actually ramp up your manufacturing? Was that, getting also like new manufacturers was that also maybe changing as well your your 3pl like what what actually went into that the before our manufacturers and 3pl the first part is that we had to convince was our internal sunday team right so at this point we built a sunday we built an e-commerce team and, and our team was directly asking us like wholesale what the heck like, what, what, why are we doing what is this we don't know how to do this <laughs> and colton and i are saying trust us yeah we, we know how to do this don't worry we know how to do this um but you know, sure enough, we didn't have the, the internal capacity to do it. So one of the things that we did early on was to seek out you know a GM for a retail business, and we found an awesome person. You know, found um, Kelsey Johnson from Vermont at the time. Um, LinkedIn stock people and like cold reached out and met a few like, yeah. That, that by the way is like one of my underrated, uh, very underrated tips for finding talent and finding expertise. Is just cold LinkedIn messaging people. It's with internal joke, like that's my thing. I LinkedIn stock people, um, but it's worked out very well. <laughs> for yeah, uh, so yeah, we 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 got her on board. We reached out to um, other retail Sherpas, uh, I call them, just other folks to help us navigate launching um, into these stores, into these categories. And so once we were able to get internal resources on board, right, in, in parallel, um, we needed new for we needed new. Um, additional capacity rather um, for the manufacturing space as you alluded to. And um, actually I did the same thing here too, right? We, we, we needed to find a new partner ideally in, in the U S and I found someone on LinkedIn and we call him like, you know, he's like the Walter White of liquid fertilizer, <laughs> breaking bad reference. Um, there, there turns out like there's not many people in the U S who are uh, versed in liquid fertilizer. We found an amazing gentleman in our backyard here in Colorado who just happened to be really passionate about this stuff. So it's another like super awesome, fortunate add to our team that, um, and he had the the relationships and know how in this you know very niche form that um, introduced us to uh, a large new commentary partner in the U.S. That's been a fantastic partner for us that really allowed us to level up our supply chain capacity and, and scale efficiency and cost. That's amazing. That's amazing. No, I, I, I appreciate you sharing how link, how you actually hacked LinkedIn uh, to actually find talent and actually find um, people that ended up being, you know, the perfect, the perfect people for uh, launching retail that, that came from that experience. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things that I learned out of necessity early on is that yes, operations focused but there's quite a bit of selling involved in operations especially for a startup right you got to sell yourselves to suppliers and comments to convince them to do business with you and to talent right like that um you gotta pitch them on you know the, the mission the motivations and the opportunity and so that mindset of, of selling and winning over people um just really helped totally how how also since you're you're obviously, and now I know you're in, you know, you're in uh, Target, you're in Lowe's, you're in Walmart. You've really, really, um, you know, expanded um, into retail. As you say, you, you you launched in 700 stores to begin with in Walmart year two. Then you went nationwide in Walmart, which is fantastic and, you know, extremely exciting. How also do you approach like new SKUs and when to actually launch new SKUs um, when it comes to supply chain? Yeah, yeah, I I laugh because there's a good, healthy tension we have with this company over like how fast we do it. and. For some context, you know, my, my previous company, we we launched something like 75 new SKUs a year. We were really good at it. And that's probably one of the reasons why Colt thought it would be a good fit for Sunday is that I had that experience. 
Um, but out of that experience, I, I knew that 80-20 rule existed, right? Of like, you know, your top 20% of the speeds are really going to drive most of the volume. So I, I came in with that bias of like, all right, we need discipline here and what we launch, how much we launch. Um, in hindsight, I probably was too biased that way because um, you know, we started with fertilizer. When we launched our first seeds and fertilizer, our first seed and weed control products, we couldn't keep them in stock. Like we just could not produce enough. We I ordered too low. Um, I just didn't have enough. And then at one point, I had one of our customer service reps and his roommates like sticker bags, like sticker brown bags with our label on it because I couldn't get our manufacturer to produce more in time. So early on, I definitely biased too low, right? too lean, too lean and mean. And I probably admit that now. Um, but I think it was in that it's still a good bias to have right to be more con controlled um, as we've expanded into new categories right is um, took took some bigger bets right with new products um, that we were confident in for like the core lawn and garden offering and for maybe a little less adjacent secondary tertiary categories things we're trying like plants and bird seeds and hardware we um, made more limited bets, right? Smaller quantities, smaller molecules to see what we can test and, you know, with the mindset of like, okay, if this works, um, if this works, we're okay being out of stock. Um, and if it doesn't, small enough investment that we think we can sell through. It seems like you have so much demand that maybe you don't have to deal with this type of, um, type of issue, but do you, do you ever have any dead stock, um, issues when it comes to inventory? And if so, how did you deal with it? Yeah, no, I wish we didn't have any. I think every consumer <laughs> brand has those issues, right? It's, um, it's just the nature of innovating. You're going to have a lot of hits and you're going to have some misses too. Um, for us, you know, we're starting to explore some regional outlets. Um, and um, fortunately, what we learn every day, like, uh, the demand is out there from our customer base. We have a large enough customer base that a lot of it um, will sell through. Um, but we're to accelerate some of that for products, you know, we're exploring regional um, regional outlets to to offload some of that stuff. How also did you approach or navigate rather like the the global supply chain crisis in the past two years? Like, what's been like the most challenging part as you think about like the operations for Sunday? What what were some of the biggest challenges during like the past um, that that period? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was a wild run. Um, I remember it was, it was a month of March and like the NBA closed and I thought, Oh wow, the world is shutting down. And I remember talking with our demand target and, and Coulter saying, Hey, uh, should we cut demand? <laughs> and we're like, what, what feels right here? Um, and you know, we threw around some numbers, you know, like, yeah, should we cut demand 30, 40, 50%? Like, it feels like it's a prudent thing to do. You know, so we settled on something and, and we cut orders, you know, not foreseeing that, oh, wow, this this is going to lead to a huge spike in, in people, customers at home wanting to take care of and invest in their outdoor property. And right? so we actually saw a massive surge in demand, as a lot of e-com companies did. Um, and so, yeah, super proud of how our team navigated it. And we had to get extremely scrappy and, and proactive as you know, it was me back on the phone with our head of marketing saying, hey, guys, I got to constrain your demand again because my supply is uh, once again challenged. Not the logistics at this point right now. It's getting stuff. Um, it's getting our product, right? So our packaging, a lot of it comes from China. Um, and we had products coming out of Europe and Canada as well. Um, fortunately, we were never completely um, choked off the supply. Um, we navigated, we had to get creative with our freight, um, with our freight sources, um, at some point dealt with like a Canadian blockade. Um, but we were able to navigate it with you know, a combination of being scrappy on the supply chain side and, and having to limit demand, right? You know, turn down our ad spend to fulfill what, what we have, what we were able to produce. Um, so definitely a lot of lessons and redundancies, um, the, the, the need for that and you know one well, quick example of like the supply chain craziness um, the, the component that was hardest to 
uh, procure at one point was trigger sprayers. It's like the, the sprayer that you'll find on top of a Windex bottle. It turns out during a global pandemic, everyone wants cleaning products. And that's what we used for our weed control. So at one point, we had, I think, half the company, which was like 20-some people at the time, searching five continents for trigger sprayers. Just because, you know, the demand for Sunday was just going through the roof and we needed to find trigger sprayers to use for our weed control. And, you know, the supply chain was at the, the point where, you know, at one point uh, a supplier said, well, good news, I found an entire cargo um, uh, container, sprayers. Bad news is they're all sorts of different colors, shapes, and sizes. But if you want them, uh, you got to take it as is. And so that was the uh, the state of supply chain at that time. Wow. And so, and and of course you did it, right? <laughs> That's where it was close. Um, fortunately, we found another option. You found another we, option. Okay. Okay. I think we went to like Taiwan or something and, and we found uh, an option of more consistent strategies. We were pretty close. With everything that's happened when it came to like the the supply, the global supply chain crunch, has that changed at all how you approach, um, how you think about inventory in terms of maybe stocking a lot more rather than maybe what you used to and actually holding a lot more um, in your warehouses? Yeah, I think that's probably the, the first order effect it did for us, right? Leading into our um, leading into our components, right? Our, our our durable packaging caps, sprayers, things like that, that had the longest lead time, that was more durable. You know, I think like um, a lot of other companies, you know, we we did experience some some whipsaw effects of like over ordering in hindsight, right? And a little, little too much of that stuff, so. Um, I alluded to the lessons of redundancies. One of the things that we invested in and did was build a lot of redundant supply chain sources in North America um, for a lot of these products that we were reliant on um, in Asia and Europe for, right, to, to shorten those lead times for us and to give us more flexibility um, into uh, you know, quantity and mix. I've had a question to you, Jay. Um, what would you value more? A hundred dollars of inventory of Sunday um, could be any any one of your products or a hundred bucks cash. Yeah, that's a fun one. Uh, during the pandemic, definitely inventory. Right, I couldn't get enough of it. Right, as uh, our our marketing team definitely would say that too. Right, um, but now, right with the supply chain, the winds coming back to normal, capacity and supply aren't really issues um, for us. Um, on the flip side, right, with, with capital markets getting softer and our increasing focus on capital efficiency, you know, now the optionality of cash is is, is my preferred. Um, that's a higher value right now for us. Mike, I got a question for you. Yeah, what's your question? Would you rather $100 worth of podcast content or $100 cash? $100 of podcast content. Um, I don't know. I don't know what $100 of podcast content is. I... I'll say on the inventory side, if it's like inventory and like you can then, of course, it's your your own cogs, your own inventory, and then you can resell that, right? Then I would take inventory over cash personally because then you can then you know the inventory is worth more than cash since you since if your you know margins for example are fifty percent, then you can sell that hundred bucks inventory to two hundred dollars. Now that's if you can sell it. If it's a product that of course you can't sell, then I would take the hundred dollars cash over it. Very cool. Yeah. Um, fascinating to learn about your business one day. Uh, well, Jay, thanks so much for your time. This is a lot of fun. Likewise, this was a ton of fun. Thanks a lot, Mike. And there you have it. It was a pleasure chatting with Jay. Jay, thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the whole thing, and I hope it was helpful. For more information about Manufactured, head to manufactured.com. It's also in the show notes. Thanks for listening.